hello everyone, Caroline Daniel. I'm a partner at Brunswick and I'm delighted to be um, comparing this session from my own home. Um, I'm here to welcome Stephen Fitzpatrick, who's an extraordinary entrepreneur. He's a founder of Ovo, which is now the second biggest energy company in the UK. Um, started in 2009 and one of the rare entrepreneurs who, uh, as a startup, has taken over a big incumbent. Um, but also he's more than mm. that. He's a sort of serial entrepreneur in the way that uh, is the best uh, we like from our entrepreneurs. Founded many businesses, including a vertical aerospace company. So he's revolutionizing flight. Which makes me, and he's also revolutionising sort of zero carbon, which sounds a bit like Britain's or Ireland's version to Elon Musk. So I'm not sure if you like the Elon Musk reference, but I'll throw it out there. Um, we're here to talk about sort of the greatest opportunity, and obviously you've been thinking about low carbon for a long time, and your whole growth strategy as an entrepreneur is anchored in that opportunity. So talk talk to me about why you picked this as your area. Why did you become a green tech entrepreneur? Good morning, Caroline. And yeah, I think. Everybody would take a Elon Musk reference. So thank you very much, especially after uh, the events last weekend. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I was thinking about the greatest opportunity um, and, and how to frame that, the answer to the question. I, um, I think for such a long time, we have all assumed that a shift towards zero carbon would involve enormous compromises, uh, especially as it relates to our energy system. For such a long time, renewable power has been seen as a more expensive but necessary uh, means of powering our economies and societies. But what we've seen in the innovation and the, uh, the, the, the development of renewable power markets, particularly technologies like offshore wind and solar, is such a dramatic fall in the cost of producing zero carbon renewable power um, that I think we're at a tipping point now where in this decade we will see for most customers or most economies in the world that renewable power um, becomes the cheaper alternative to fossil fuel based systems. It's going to require an enormous investment globally um, but I think it leaves us uh, not just with a greener and lower carbon option uh, or outcome, but also a better one, a better one for consumers, meaning uh, more abundant, uh, cheaper, zero carbon energy. And I was greeted this morning with an email, uh, it's about the Irish market, but there's a, a good read through for the UK and we're seeing the same trend occur all over Europe. And that's for the first time ever, sorry, the second time ever, they've had negative power prices on their electricity system running for the whole day. So if you want to buy electricity in Ireland over the last weekend, not the one just gone, the one before, you were being paid to use energy for the whole day, not just for a half an hour, not just for an hour, but being paid for the whole day. So the idea that we've got so much zero carbon electricity on the system that the prices turn negative is really promising for everybody that hopes to see a global energy system shift entirely towards renewables. So what needs to change in the moment in terms of the infrastructure to enable that change to happen? We spoke the other day about the sort of the rise of the decentralized grid and how that's changing the role of the consumer making their own energy in their own homes, rather than thinking about a conventional grid run by a big national grid and very centralized. What kinds of things do we need to see change to really enable that to happen? Yeah, I think anybody that knows... Uh and, and uh, spend any time reading about or learning about energy systems and renewable power will know that the, the big benefit that we get from re renewable power the, it's zero carbon and almost always zero marginal cost. Um, the, the, those are the big benefits. One of the big drawbacks is intermittency. And we still have a lot of work to do as we start to dial up the proportion of energy that we get from renewable power. Um, we have a lot of work to do to try to integrate more and more of that onto the grid. And a big part of making that work is going to be, um, first of all, the electrification of energy applications. So in particular, uh, uh, a shift towards electric heat and also electric transport, so electric vehicles. So the first step is we need to electrify the applications of energy. And then um, we need to uh, change the way in which we think about balancing demand and supply in the energy system. 
And as you pointed out, we, we currently exist in a world where we have a relatively centralized system, both physically and structurally. That means a relatively small number of power stations controlled by individuals or by organizations feeding power to a distributed network of millions of consumers and businesses. In a world where we have uh, intermittent renewable generation highly distributed across the grid, the only way that we can balance supply and demand is going to be through controlling um, the demand for electricity through energy applications. And that is going to require a complete shift in both legislation, regulation, organizational structure, the way the grid operates, and most importantly, the use of artificial intelligence to securely connect and control devices everywhere up and down the country to respond to a very dynamic energy system. So what one thing do you think um, government could do right now to accelerate that transition? One of the things that's holding back the shift towards uh, one of the main things that's holding back the shift towards electrification of transport and heat is, in fact, a, a implied or an implicit subsidy um, for the carbon-based status quo. Um, so, for if I give you, for example, uh, uh, heat uh, in the UK, about eighty percent of homes in the UK are uh, heated using natural gas and, and natural gas boilers that are in consumers' homes. Um, we have about 22 million natural gas customers in the UK. Um, and the, uh, there, there are no taxes on the carbon emissions, first of all, that come from the use of burning natural gas. Second of all, there are uh, costs and subsidies and uh, environmental policy costs that have been put onto the electricity bills uh, that consumers pay. And that's true across most of Europe. And so if you use electricity to heat your home, you end up paying uh, for a large part of the cost of decarbonization. Whereas if you use gas, you, you don't contribute anything. So I think in terms of getting the, the balance right for incentives for customers, the most important thing, the most urgent thing that the UK government needs to do is to really seriously con uh, consider a carbon tax. And that would be a tax on carbon regardless of where it's emitted, uh, regardless of the source or the use. Um, and to have that, that money be fed either directly back to consumers or to help fund a zero carbon transition. So I'm just going to take you back to uh, Ovo Energy. You obviously founded it in 2009 and you saw a, you know, and it was purpose led at the, when you founded it to be sort of a green energy advocate. Fast forward to now in January, you've just taken over SSE, which is one of the biggest sort of UK energy companies. Um, you've gone from 1.5 million customers to 5 million customers and then you had COVID. So it'd just be great to hear from you what that's like, both just, first of all, the ambition of being a startup, you know, taking over an incumbent, and how do you manage that sort of culture change? You know, how did you tell your team this was a good idea and they didn't think you were crazy? Um, just be good to sort of unpack sort of, you know, the, the thinking behind that. Yeah. Um, so I think the, uh, the origin story, if you go back 10 years, uh, we had a, an ambition then to get to a million customers by 2020, which at the time seemed uh, pretty unbelievable. The, the most successful new entrant into the UK market at that time was it reached about 100,000 customers. And so um, if you look at the market back then, the big six ex-monopoly incumbents, they controlled about 99% of the UK retail market. And so the idea that it was even possible to create a scalable, you know, a serious challenger was pretty ambitious. So I think we've always had ambitious goals. Um, we got to a million customers uh, it was around 2018, um, so a couple of years ahead of target, but pretty much on plan. And when we started to look at what was coming next, we, you know, we started to think bigger. So I don't think as it came, I don't think it came as a really big surprise to anybody on the team um, that we would. Uh, you know, have this kind of ambition. Um, we we were fortunate to start a conversation with Mitsubishi Corporation from Japan back in uh, in 2018, and that led to them investing in in Ovo Energy. So it gave us the financial firepower. And about two or three weeks after that investment closed, um, the 
the merger between SSC and Empower um, unraveled. Uh, and I immediately picked up the phone and, and talked to the, the guys at SSC and said that we were interested. So I think in terms of the timing, it, it was an enormous surprise. In, in terms of what that felt like, um, it, it, it definitely, um, it's an unusual scenario where a startup or a scale up ends up acquiring an incumbent. It normally works the other way around. And there were a lot of considerations that we had to work through, not least of all cultural. Um, we had been a very fast moving, fast growing organization. And uh, the idea of acquiring a business that was shrinking uh, at the time and needed to digitize and replatform and to go through a big transition and transformation, it definitely gave me pause for thought. Um, when we dug deeper into the organization at SSC, we realized actually uh, that we shared a pretty strong cultural alignment around doing the right thing for customers and building a great place to work. And Ovo was clearly more heavily digitized and we were a bit further down the line in terms of things like smart metering, intelligent energy and so on. But the ambition or the desire was there within SSC um, and perhaps they lacked some of the technology capabilities that Ovo had built up organically. So in terms of culture, it, it's proven actually to be a really great fit. We have, um, we had this um, coronavirus lockdown happen six weeks after make, making this acquisition. And we went from a company with not just 1.5 million customers to 5 million, but um, about one and a half thousand employees to just under 10,000 employees. And then six weeks after making the acquisition, we were told everybody has to work from home. And so it was an enormous challenge. Uh, and we saw the best of both organizations coming together. We saw um, Ovo's technology capability and agility really uh, prove uh, its strength and resiliency. So we were able to get uh, our, our 1,500 employees working from home within a matter of days. Um, we were able to apply that knowledge and the know-how to SSE's um, operations, and largely they were all working from home within three to four weeks. But we were able to take SSE's capability of operating at scale, of ensuring that um, we were uh, looking after our people properly, looking after our customers. They had much stronger risk management processes in place, as you would expect from a more mature business. And so when we were faced with this enormous challenge of uh, having 10,000 people just about working from home, working remotely, serving our customers, uh, and still going through the day-to-day -day, uh, processes and necessities of running a a very large UK energy company and we were able to do both at the same time we were able to move fast at scale and so it's been a really successful first five months um, but of course there's there's a lot of challenges still to come. So talking of those challenges obviously um, it was interesting reading about you've obviously um, unfortunately had to announce a number of job losses two and a half thousand two thousand six hundred recently and one of the arguments is obviously around the acceleration towards digital. This is a lot of companies are seeing this at the moment that people are going from 2020 to 2030 and basically in the space of three months in terms of transformational change. Can you just unpack what you've seen in terms of the experience that people have gone online in completely new ways and then they're not going back now in terms of old ways of managing their energy? Yeah, I think it's probably worth talking a little bit about that. Um, from a personal point of view or from a human point of view, uh, it, it was definitely one of the considerations that gave me most pause for thought um, when we were making the decision whether or not to go ahead with the acquisition. Uh, at Ovo, over the past 10 years, we've created you know just under 2,000 new jobs. We've only ever really been growing, and it's always felt good. It's felt like we are deploying new technology to existing challenges and creating new jobs in the process. Uh, acquiring SSC meant being on the other side of that. And again, from a personal perspective, it, it was something I had to think long and hard about. Did I want to be, did I want to, to move from being an entrepreneur that was creating hundreds of jobs to, to one where I was going to be making people redundant? And it was pretty obvious looking at the numbers that SSC needed to go through this kind of transformation and and, and we, we talked about this over the, the past couple of weeks, that this was a, the, the, the redundancies and the, 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 the changes to the company structure, all of these things that 
we've had to do in the last couple of months were, were things that were going to have to be done in the coming years anyway as the market changed. Um, but uh, the, the acceleration that you talked about, that shift um, in consumer behavior uh, that we've all talked about for such a long time, the shift in ways of working and working remotely and so on, that we've all been forced into has greatly accelerated that change. And I mean, from a personal perspective, I hated video conferences. The idea that you would have me on a virtual stage on video broadcasting from my kitchen, nobody would have believed that six months ago. I, I, I told my team, if they couldn't make it to the office, that's fine. They, they can't make it to the office, but we're not doing a, 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 a round table discussion with eight people in a room and then one person on a conference call. Um, and I was dead set against it. And actually, having been forced into it, <laughs> I find that it works really well <laughs> and that the technology has changed since my previous experiences and that this offers us a chance to connect with more people in different locations at the same time. And, and I've been on that journey too. I've been on that digital transformation myself. And when I think about that means for customers, uh, uh, companies and their customers, I mean, we have seen it. We have seen, you know, we have tried for years and years and years to try to get customers to engage with us online or, you know, by downloading apps and so on. And humans are real creatures of habit. They they resist if they don't want to. And because they're customers, you know, we don't force them to. We say we will serve you on whatever channel you want to be served. And then overnight, they're told, actually, we cannot support this anymore. You, you'll have to download this app. You'll have to log in. And instantly we find that customers, of course, they can do it. And having made that change, they find it's a better experience for them. It, it is easier for them to manage their accounts online than it is to, to dial in and speak to you most times. Um, and so I think having made that shift, we see it it's a, will, I think, become a real permanent shift in consumer behavior. And, and companies that are able to adapt to that quickly will succeed where others will fail. And just to go back to sort of taking over an incumbent, uh, this is again a rare thing. I just want to unpack some of the lessons if you've got startups watching or entrepreneurs watching. Obviously, bigger companies have tremendous scale and opportunities. Um, I rather like the um, different cultural story you told me the other day about arriving at SSC and being met by various people wearing dragon outfits and dressed up as daffodils, which is obviously completely normal for startups, but perhaps less in uh, um, for SSC. But I love to just unpack What's, what's it really been like in terms of just a, an anecdote about managing sort of a young startup coming and taking over such a big company? What are the lessons quickly for someone? Well, the first thing I would say is that when we did the takeover, we had 1,500 or slightly more employees already. So it was, it's was it been a long time since Ovo felt like a, a pure startup. And I think in the UK, we would do well to consider, you know, as companies move out of the startup phase into scale up phase, there are very significant and specific challenges that startups don't face and maintaining culture is, is definitely one of them. One of the things I noted, I, I did a tour of the five largest offices across SSC over the two days to do a series of town halls and introduce myself, introduce the OVO story and, and primarily to take questions from the SSC audience. And everywhere I went, I had a fantastic welcome. Um, they have offices up and down the country, and there was definitely a regional theme, as you alluded to. Um, the thing that struck me beyond the bagpiping and the and the dragon costumes and the uh, and the energy that everybody uh, the, the audience had really put into the welcome was just how seamlessly everything went. And everywhere I arrived, I was greeted exactly on time with somebody who knew exactly where I needed to go. I got mic'd up. I got led to wherever I was speaking from. Everything worked. And then I took my questions and then I moved on to the next office. And then the transport, the logistics all worked seamlessly. And with no disrespect whatsoever to the internal comms or the operational teams at Ovo Energy, I had never experienced this before where everything just worked. And uh, I found out afterwards um, that it wasn't by accident that there'd been many rehearsals, many um, weeks and weeks of preparation, lots of different technical teams and operational teams involved. It was not by accident that everything ran smoothly. And did I thought, have, did you have a stunt double then? Uh, 
I have, you know, I didn't go into all the details about, uh, you know, how it worked and how they worked out exactly how tall the stage would need to be and and so on. I can only imagine. But the point I wanted to make was that that sense, I, I felt a great sense of perhaps relaxation is the wrong word, but confidence in the fact that we had acquired a company that that really focused on getting things right and not making mistakes. And in, in startup culture, there, there's, you know, the, the real feeling that at a small scale, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, and it's okay, you know, the, 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 the famous uh, quote about move fast and break things. And I think it's true as a small company, you get given the benefit of the doubt as a, as a startup, you're forced to take risk. You're forced to um, keep innovating uh, and, and, and risk getting things wrong because ultimately you'll get it right. You survive and then, and then, uh, you know, success leaves from there as a larger organization, you have a lot more to lose. And one of the things that struck me in our acquisition was if we could combine this focus on getting things right at scale, uh, focus on operational excellence, consistency, risk management, if we could combine all of those things with a culture of innovation and uh, technology, uh, embracing technology, it could be a really powerful combination. And, and so far, the last five months is really proving that narrative out. And what makes you um, optimistic about the sort of shift to a low carbon economy? Um, obviously, Pricing always is an issue for customers, and I think it's. I think I read about twenty percent of your customers have taken the sort of renewable option. So not everyone is going to go to it because it's just more expensive. Obviously, we're facing a time when there's a real pressure on the economy, and you know debates about how far our company is going to continue to do the right thing around low carbon, or continue actually going to be under pressure just to save and protect jobs, and therefore push the sort of green economy back. What's your narrative about where we are right now? Well, there's there's a lot to talk about there, and I'm going to pick up your last point um, first. So we've had to go through a process now where we've made over two and a half thousand people redundant. Where we've had to reduce those the number of people that work in the company, um, responding to both the situation we find ourselves in with coronavirus and its impact, but also the change in customer behaviour. The the message that I have had to everybody impacted and and to the wider community beyond is that. We are not in the business of saving jobs that are being made redundant by advances in technology. And I think the language of saving jobs um, is, is not altogether helpful. I think what we need to be in the business in is, first of all, doing the right thing for our customers, without which we don't get the license to operate. Second of all, where people's livelihoods are impacted by changes in technology, we need to look after the people that are impacted. We need to support and look after those individuals that lose their jobs. But we don't need to save the jobs. We need to create new jobs. And I think that is where I see the big opportunity in, in the decarbonization story and in the next decade. I think there is by far and away the, the, the strongest appetite for change as it relates to renewable energy and the environment that we've ever seen. Before coronavirus, all we were talking about was Extinction Rebellion, um, the wildfires in Australia, the impact on the environment of global warming, the rising uh, concentration of carbon in the atmosphere and what we're going to do about it. And I know that we're going to get back to that. And there's going to be this strong public demand for a change towards zero carbon. And now we're going to have the biggest government stimulus globally that we have ever had in peacetime. And I think when the two things collide, we're, we're, uh, collide, we're going to see an enormous investment in zero carbon technology, an enormous investment in the retrofitting in particular of consumer homes all across the Western world, an upgrading of our energy system. And we're going to see this all packed into the next 10 years. And the number of jobs and opportunities it's going to create is going to be astonishing. But I think where we talk about saving jobs, you know, that's not consistent with the narrative of building back better. If we try to keep all the same jobs, all the same economies, all the same companies, we're not going to build a better future. So I think we have to be ready to embrace the opportunity and embrace the change, but then also make sure we look after all of the people and the, 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 make sure we address the human cost of that technology change. So a very quick question at the end, but we might have longer in the Q&A. Um, given that you've painted a very optimistic um, picture of the future, what what makes you worried about the future of, um, particularly driven by tech? What actually scares you about the future at the moment? 
I, I think most entrepreneurs are optimistic by nature. Um, if there's a thing that concerns me about uh, the change that we, we see in front of us, I would say I'm, I enjoy uh, learning about lots of different subjects. A history is definitely one of them. And if we look back in history at times of great change, especially uh, technological change, we will see consistently that there are winners and losers. And I think given the state of inequality that we have in terms of inequality of uh, opportunity and inequality of outcome, I think unless we think very carefully about how we manage the social impact of the uh, technology change that we need to see, we're going to see enormous social upheaval. And so we really need to think very carefully, how do we make the next industrial revolution one where we can share the benefits equally across society? I think if we get that right, there's very little to, to fear in the future. Great. Well, I think we're about to run out of time on this session, but I, I might just ask another one, a sneaky one before Simon uh, hands over to Tabitha and we can come back to Q&A. So um, just to the Elon Musk part of the conversation, um, you have a vertical aerospace business as well, um, trying to decarbonize flight. How's that going in terms of how, how, how far away are we from electric flight? Well, we already have electric flight. Um, we have planes that are, are available, uh, perhaps not quite certified, but certainly available for pre-order uh, for electric flight. Range is obviously the issue with electric vehicles on the ground, and it's no different uh, in the air. In fact, weight is an even bigger problem. Um, but we're getting there, and I think uh, at Vertical, we expect between the next three and four years to have not just electric flight, but electric vertical takeoff flight that will transform how we fly around cities and the neighboring countryside. It will transform how we think about um, you know, connecting spaces, especially in a world where we're now working remotely. Um, safety is by far and away the issue that dominates aerospace and, um, and for very good reason, passengers, trust that aircraft simply work and never fail and when we start working with new technology whether it's with carbon fibers we've been through with aerospace the last 20 years and now lithium-ion batteries um failure rates in aerospace are one in 10 million times in other words a system can fail in one in 10 million occurrences and so that's a very very high bar and i'd say when the technology meets the safety requirements of aerospace, you'll see this big explosion, but it, it is going to take some time um, to, 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 to meet the standards of safety in, in aerospace that are required. And how, how long are we away from your first passenger um, aircraft? For general commercial use, again, we think 2023, the coronavirus impact, it doesn't directly impact the technology development, but everybody working remotely and so it has slowed things down and we've probably lost a little bit of time this year. Um, so it could be into 2024, but it's, it's you know, the earlier, the, the first half of this decade, we should see electric, commercial electric flight. And, and what's going to be your first trip? I'm desperate to make the trip between London and Bristol. So we've got uh, OVO offices in London and Bristol, uh, the vertical factories in Bristol. I live in London. Uh, and so that is a trip that really excites me. The range is going to be right on the edge of what's possible. Um, and so we will see. Can they take off from your roof? You know, I, there's a lot of rules that need to be written around uh, local aerospace, uh, airspace regulation. Um, I'm not entirely sure my neighbours would thank me for taking off from, from my roof, but uh, there are a few tall buildings nearby. We'll have to look at the airspace around them. Yes, your neighbours actually told me to ask you that question. Did they? Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Simon, I know that we are over time, so I don't know if you want to patch Tabitha in. If not, I'm happy to continue going. Hello, thank you very much. That was absolutely inspiring. I think you're right about that moment of time being now we're all demanding so much change, but actually the uh, the economic stimulus from from other countries coming into play has got a pretty magic moment. So um, that was really, really inspiring. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.